Yeah, that's going on. Um, now I'm delighted to introduce this evening's speaker. David Humphreys is the Tree Management Officer of the City of London Corporation. Just going to come over. Let's just click on with that. Yeah, here we go. He leads a team of conservation arborists who are managing the trees of Hampstead Heath, Heath and the focus there is on tree safety and health and biodiversity. David Humphreys has been applauded for his work preserving the capital's most precious trees. And last year, he won the London Tree Officers Association Individual Commitment Award. And the judge hailed his consistent dedication and commitment to protecting London's trees. I'm going to stop sharing my screen now and I'm going to hand you over to David for what's going to be a really interesting and enjoyable talk. Thank you very much. Good Thank evening, you. everybody. There we go. Yep, that's fine. Thank you. I think we're there. Okay. Okay. So good evening, everybody. Um, this is a great honour for me and big thanks to the LNHS, for the opportunity, the invitation and the opportunity to, to share what is my passion uh, at work and away from work. So my talk this evening is about the fascinating interaction between trees and fungi, the, the kingdom of fungi. Um, Maria's already introduced me, but uh, just to repeat, uh, I'm a trees management officer for the City of London Corporation. I'm based at Hampstead Heath, which is a, um, an urban open space in the north of London, um, next to Kenwood. And I've been working there for 35 years and about 20 of those, um, I've been really, really fascinated about the interaction between fungi and trees. What's not to like about fungi? I mean, they are just absolutely incredible uh, to under try and understand. Um, we know so little about them, really. Uh, but this is what I come across at work on a regular uh, uh, occasion, um, whilst I'm out inspecting and um, generally just walking through the, through the woods. I currently have almost about 22,000 images of fungi in four, 584 species folders, and this is building constantly. In fact, today uh, I found a new species to me at Hampstead, uh, which is uh, a, a bizarre phenomenon called hair ice, which is uh, where ice protrudes out of a, a wood volume. In fact, in this case, it was actually from a, um, a fungal fruiting body called uh, Trametes. Um, so that was a new one to me just today, so I've added that to my list. Hampstead Heath, um, it's, a, it's a fantastic open space and I'm pr privileged to work there. Um, and we have roughly about 25,000 trees um, and we have about 10 million visitors a year. And in fact, that, those numbers are probably not correct due to the pandemic. We've had a massive increase in numbers, uh, which has, uh, a huge effect potentially on the health of the soil and the actual trees and, and the flora and fauna within the soil. Um, a colleague and a bit of a mentor of mine, Andy Overall, the field mycologist uh, who studied trees and fungi, well fungi particularly at Hampstead, has recorded over 600 species of fungi at Hampstead and has kindly shared uh, all of those records for us, which is in part where my learning has developed from. So a uh, huge thanks to Andy. Uh, these images here depict what Hampstead used to look like only a couple of hundred years ago. So the image in the top left-hand corner here is, is a painting by John Constable, the famous landscape painter, um, originally from Suffolk, but uh, moved down to Hampstead for, for a period of life um, and painted all the landscapes there. And you can quite clearly see that the landscape back then was almost denuded of trees. It was a heathland predominantly and, and was grazed as well. So there were very few trees. Um, but over the last couple of hundred years, uh, we, we've had a, you know, a planting uh, and also um, self-seeding of secondary woodland. So um, although we have a mix of grassland habitat and woodland, um, there's, there, there are, as I said earlier, about 25,000 trees here. Uh, the bottom two images show an avenue of London plains uh, Plantanus cross the Spanica that were planted um, about a hundred years ago. And you can see how, how, how large those have grown. 
I think this is possibly one of the reasons that we have um, such good records, such high numbers of different species of fungi at the site. Not only do we have heathland and grassland fungi, uh, but we have um, all the species that are associated with trees. Um, the sapotrophs and uh, the mycorrhiza that are associated with all the trees that we now have. And I, and I think this is in part mostly because we've had an increase in trees on the site. Um, no evidence towards this. Um, just, to, just to clarify, this, this isn't an academic lecture. This is a bit of a show and tell event. Um, um, and I'm not even a field mycologist, uh, as I said before, I'm a trees management officer. So these are my observations. Three and a half decades at the same site, uh, watching the wood volumes become colonized and go through fungal succession, gives me a real insight, I think, uh, into watching what happens to these wood volumes. Uh, these images here depict um, a indigenous uh, oak, Quercus roba, which was felled in the great storm we had in, in southeast of England in 1987. Uh, and these images uh, depict the actual felling of that during the storm. We left the timber in this case, and I've been able to watch the succession of fungi uh, fruiting on this wood volume for, for the best part of 30 years, uh, which is quite unique, I think. Um, I'm very, very sure that the majority of the people watching tonight will understand what fungi are, but for those that don't, what is fungi? So fungi predominantly really is microfilaments uh, of hyphae, which um, collect together and form sheets, uh, move through the wood or the soil volume. And um, that, that's, that's what the fungi is. Uh, these images here show the fanning out of the hyphae um, under the bark of the trees um, and also across leaf litter uh, and the bark. The next images here show mycelial cords where the cords are moving again under the bark of this, this wood volume, which is uh, a pine species that's fallen over. Um, I don't actually know what the species of this cord forming fungi are. I've never seen anything fruit on this, uh, but I do keep my eyes open to see what may come uh, fruiting from this wood volume at some point. So perennial brackets, um, we've got the classic hooth fungus uh, conch, as the Americans would call it, and fruit body we call it over here. Uh, they persist over many years and they have incremental layers, but these are not annual growths uh, per se. They, they, they could happen annually, but these are annual growths that happen due to environmental uh, conditions within the wood volume and surrounding area. Uh, and in terms of how much energy the, the fungi has to, to produce its spore producing fruit bodies. Two examples here of, of perennial fruit bodies are Fomis formentaris, the hoof fungus, and Fomatopsis pinacola, uh, the red banded polypore. And then you have annual fruit bodies. And what we see here in this image are the scar, the black scar of the previous year's fruiting um, and the younger developing orange yellow mass here, which is in an otis hispidus, uh, we call the shaggy polypore on ash. And uh, these fruit bodies are developed through just one year. Um, in fact, over maybe a couple of weeks or a month or so, and they develop and put on their spore layers, sporulate, and then senesce and die. And then, as you can see, they, they tend to either drop off uh, the tree, leaving the scar behind. The next slide here shows, uh, depicts um, the development of a single fruit body, later porous sulfurious. Uh, which I went and visited um, over a 30 day period uh, a couple of years ago within an oak wood volume, a decayed hollow oak wood volume. And you can see the amount of energy that goes in to the development of a single fruit body in a relatively short space of time. Um, here, you know, you can quite clearly see the, the very, very small beginnings within the, the hollowed out uh, habitat cav cavity here, um, coming through, filling out, uh, getting to the point where it's mature and dropping its spore uh, and then going into senescence for the last few days of its, of its life. In terms of identification of fungi, the, um, 
morphological features are very, very important, but, but you really need to have a, have a closer look, a microscopic look at fungi, looking at the size and shape of the spores. Um, I'm not an expert in this. Um, I've had some experience, Andy, Andy overall, the field mycologist has shown me many times uh, examples and specimens I've taken to him. Uh, and also I've been lucky enough to been at uh, a field trip to Padua in northern Italy, looking uh, particularly at ceratocystis, which is a, a disease, a fungal disease of uh, London Plain. Uh, and uh, we had an opportunity to go abroad to have a look at uh, how, the, how this fungal species was affecting that particular tree. Um, and, and we got to grips with micros microscopy, um, but it's a, it's a whole field which um, it would take many years to, to become an expert in, I suspect. Very often I, I get asked because I, I you know, I, I, I do know my fungal fruiting bodies, um, but I get asked by a lot of colleagues and other consultants um, to help identify fruiting bodies. And one of the things I do tend to uh, get asked quite a lot uh, is how to go about seeing for sure what's happening, uh, what, what a fruit body is. Um, so I, I, I will ask people that have, whether or not they've taken a slice of the fruit body to show the pore layer and the flesh, because quite of, of, uh, that's one way we can be quite clear uh, determining between two different species. So this picture depicts um, Bridget Porus on Marius, uh, which is a species which was predominantly on elm in the UK, uh, but then we had Dutch elm disease in the 70s and 80s, which got rid of the majority of our elms uh, down in the south. Uh, and this species particularly is, is, has become associated with a lot of other new tree hosts, uh, oak and willow and a number of other tree species. Um, but the bracket itself is quite nondescript at times, um, can be covered by this green algae. Um, and it can look like some other species, some other genus of fungal brackets. Um, Proneoporia fractionaria is, is one it looks very similar to. Um, so I quite often will ask people whether or not they've taken a slice to have a look at the flesh and choose because that's a key uh, identification um, way of finding out what, what species you have. Here is an example of um, the, the variety and diversity of flesh and pores. Uh, we have Ganoderma resonation in the top left hand image here, which has very dark brown tubes uh, where the spores drop out of, but the flesh is, is um, a lot paler. Um, this is a, an annual Ganoderma species, as opposed to the perennial Ganoderma species, which are quite different in terms of, of their flesh and tubes. Um, on the top right image here, we have Rigid porus almarius with its very, very white flesh and orange cinnamon pore layer, very, very thin pore layer. Um, bottom left hand image, we have the annual Fistulina hepatica, uh, which we call the beefsteak here in the UK, um, the fresh kind of does look like um, fresh beef with its blood dripping out there. And uh, there's this perennial and Ganoderma australe uh, bracket here, which you can see the, the difference between the, the darker flesh, uh, the trauma layer here at the top compared to the annual Ganoderma resonation here, which has a very, very light flesh. Spore, um, spore color is, a, is another way for us to determine an identification of a, of a particular species. This, this series of images shows a, a, a range of colors of spore from white, yellow, saffron, brown through to black with Daldenia concentrica in the middle to lower images here. Um, so this is another way of determining um, tree, tree uh, fungal species identification. Um, there's some very, very useful spore color charts available in books and online. Uh, a couple of really, really good examples here. Um, the spore print color of the great uh, big index fungi species at the First Nature website. Uh, this is Pat O'Reilly's website, I believe. Uh, First Nature, www.firstnature. And Guild Mushroom spore print color table by Leif Goodwin. Um, I've left the uh, the links here if anybody's interested in having a look at those and um, they're very useful. Um, looking at the fruit body pore layer, um, again these the, the actual diameter and the shape and size of the pores are dramatically different across the genus um, and again both from macroscopically and microscopically you can you can use the, 
the, the features here uh, to determine um, the species. Uh, we have um, Phaeolus frenicii, Dias maizegill in the top left-hand corner, uh, Phalinus ignarius here, which is the willow bracket, with its very, very small pores. And the bottom left image is the oak maizegill, uh, which, although they do look like gills, are actually pores. They're just very elongated pores in a maze-like structure. And then you have your gills of your mushrooms. Uh, and so, um, these again, there's very many different attachments and colors and uh, different ways to determine um, the morphological difference between uh, species. They can be freely attached like the ammonitis where the, the, uh, the gills don't attach to the actual stem of the mushroom or they can be decurrent where they do attach uh, as in the Pleurotus drainus here, uh, one of the uh, oyster fungi. Uh, more images here of the variety uh, in, in gill color and uh, attachments. And looking at individual genuses and the variety within the genuses. So all these species here were, were found at Hampstead Heath. Um, in our woodlands. Um, this is the Ammonita genus. And <clears throat> this is just a, 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 an eight species representation of the variety that we find um, and, and how different these can look. Right through from your popular uh, well-known Ammonita muscaria, fly garrick, uh, down to the death cap, uh, the Ammonita phalloides, which can look quite like um, honey fungus and other species. So it's very important within the genus to understand which species you have. These are very toxic uh, species. Um, the Ganoderma uh, genus is also um, a, a wide variety of, of species within there. There's six in the UK, um, many, many more across the world, of course. And there are three perennial um, Ganoderma species here in the UK, uh, Ganoderma apollinatum, uh, Ganoderma australe, and Ganoderma pfeifferi, the top three. And there are three annual uh, Ganoderma brackets with Ganoderma lucidum, Resonaceum, and Carnosum. These images here depict the species diversity within the coprinoid species, uh, genus. Um, although the name changes of the genus actually change uh, almost uh, as, as often as the weather here in the UK. Um, they would have been coprinuses when I first started learning about this particular genus. Um, and now, now they're all listed into many, many different genuses, coprinellus uh, and coprinus on a couple of species here. Um, but again, we're just uh, representing the, the variety within a particular one, you know, one group of fungi. Um, here we have the Harissiums, which are in the UK relatively rarely recorded species, although a couple of these we do have at Hampstead Heath. Um, one of these we don't, the Harissium coralloides we don't have recorded yet at Hampstead, um, yet probably being the key word here, I think. Um, whereas the other two we, we do, even though Harissium aerovinaceus, which is very rarely recorded in particularly London, um, we do have it on uh, oak volume. Uh, wounds locally at Hampstead, uh, at Kenwood. Um, another genus or, or group diversity here, we have the puffballs. I think these images show quite clearly the, the, the variety in size and textures of all the different species or some of the different species within, within the, uh, the puffballs. So there are three main types of tree associated fungi. There are parasitic fungi. These are the fungi that attack weakened trees, sustain themselves by breaking down their host. There are the saprotrophic species, which are the recyclers. These are the fungi that break down the dysfunctional woody and leafy matter, helping to release nutrients back into the soil for, for the trees to take back up. And you have the mycorrhizal fungi, um, which is a, was a fascinating group of fungi that are, from my perspective, um, I'm only really just slowly becoming to understand the importance uh, and the diversity within those uh, species associated with, with the mycorrhiza. These are the fungi that create a symbiotic relationship, mutualistic with uh, the root contact, helping trees with uptake of water and nutrients um, whilst they're getting carbohydrates in return. 
And there are two basic types. Um, there are many more, but there are two basic types. There's endophytic mycorrhiza and, and ectophytic mycorrhiza, the arbuscular mycorrhiza. So with the parasitic fungi, um, these are examples here. These are the ones that um, move into dysfunctional wood volumes. Um, there's obviously a lot of debate, I think, around whether or not these actually move into hydrated wood volumes, sound wood volumes. Um, I, I, I understand from my reading and my observations that parasitic fungi do attack weakened trees um, and they can be weakened by a number of reasons. They can be biotic or abiotic reasons for trees to become weak. Uh, and the parasites, these species, particularly Armillaria media, the honey fungus, Foliota sclerosa, the, uh, the, um, the shaggy scaly cap, uh, Fomatoporia punctata, although this might be the wrong species for this genus here in London at the moment, and Gymnopus, which used to be Calibia fuspes, these are all parasitic fungi that do attack and severely attack distressed and dysfunctional wood volumes. And then we have the saptrose. So these four examples here, uh, desar malaria, which would have been our malaria, is now desar malaria tabescens. This is the ringless honey fungus. So it's um, quite clearly very different from the other armillarias and its morphological um, makeup because it doesn't have a ring on its stem. This is, from my understanding, wholly saprotrophic. So it is uh, just getting its nutrition from very dysfunctional dead pieces of wood volume. Um, and other examples being the geastrum species here in the leaf litter and the wood chip, and also things like the fluted bird nest fungi, uh, which we are starting to see a, a large increase on our imported wood chips uh, that we sometimes lay around the base of trees. Some examples here of the mycorrhizal species that I find, or we find around um, the roots of trees. Um, and as I was saying earlier, these are mutualistic uh, with the tree and beneficial. Uh, we have four different genus here. We have the Amanita, uh, Boletus, um, Sulalus, and Lucaria. Um, the, just these images again show the diversity and the, the, and the different variety of how they look. And when they're fruiting, uh, this is where we see them. We see them out on the roots. You can see here in the top left hand image, uh, the Amanita muscaria out of the tips of this um, birch tree um, where the mycelium and the microfilaments are attaching themselves to the roots at the extremity, uh, but also can be uh, the base of the tree um, where the interaction of the trade-off between water nutrients and carbohydrates happens. And again, these are, these are the ectomycorrhizal. So these are the ones that put on the mushrooms, the fruit bodies, the, endophyte, the endomycorrhizas, the arbusculars, they don't put on the same fruit bodies. So they, they, they um, reproduce in a different way. Um, I'll just go back one slide. So the bottom left hand image here, the where it's circled, these are three separate species of mycorrhizal fungi, all on the roots of oak. Um, and they're within about a meter or so of each other. So they're colonizing and not particularly mixing in this instance here. They're on the same, tree roots and, and having the same sort of mutualistic benefits and relationships, but as, as a colonization within the uh, soil, they are seemingly keeping separate. Although this image here, the second uh, this image here on the right hand bottom side is showing two genus of, fun of, of mycorrhizal fungi seemingly looking like they're next to each other on this uh, birch root. That's uh, again Amanita and I believe that was Russula. So we have a number of rare and threatened species of fungi in the UK, and I think about five of those are actually protected by law, um, which would make it um, illegal to damage or pick that particular species. Um, at Hampstead, although we don't have the very rarely recorded oak polypore, um, I suspect there's no real reason why we won't see this at some point. Um, it's the actual habitat of that fungal species that's, that's actually rare and um, uh, we don't we don't have a lot of that around, but uh, we're, we're trying desperately to change that. The top left hand image is Podocypher multizonata, the many zone rosette, uh, which the UK has, I believe, something in the region of about 70 to 80 percent of the European records of this particular species. But 
uh, as the next slide, oh, well, in a couple of slides, I'll show you, <clears throat> we actually have a very, very uh, a real hot spot for Polar Cipher um, at Hampstead. Um, this slide here I put in recently because it's been updated um, from a new record. This is Harissi Marinaceus on a veteran oak at Kenwood, which is a neighbouring property to Hampstead. I first recorded this with Andy um, back in 2010, in October 2010. Uh, this is in on a, a wound, a, 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 a branch wound up at the top of the trunk of this oak tree, about eight to ten metres up. So it's quite hard to see from the ground. Um, we, we, picked up this from an aerial inspection. Um, but this is an infrequent fruiter. Uh, this species particularly, although um, you can buy mycelial plugs of this species and grow them quite readily, um, in the wild, they do not fruit uh, so readily. And my observations on this particular tree uh, and this fungus, you can see at the bottom here, um, October 2010, the first record, took three years for it to fruit again, and then it has taken another seven years for that particular species to fruit again on the same wood volume. Um, as I mentioned earlier, this is Podocypher modestinata. The heath is, is a real hotspot for this uh, particular fungal species. It's quite a beautiful, pretty rosette. Um, we are starting to find it increasing its host range as well, uh, which is, is Something's happening, we're starting to record this quite a lot across the many different species of fungi. Podocypher would normally have been uh, recorded mainly on old parkland oaks, veteran oaks. Um, and it, this is one of the reasons it was probably rarely recorded. But at Hampstead, uh, we have it on not just oak, but beech, hornbeam, lime, um, and a variety of different oaks on red oak uh, and also horse chestnut, um, which talking to other observers, fungal observers and field mycologists uh, in the UK. This, this is not a, this is still quite a rare um, discovery, I think, seeing this um, host range increase. Uh, one of the species I'm very fascinated by, that although we don't have it at Hamsa particularly, it's, it is in London at some of the older parkland sites like Richmond, and at some, I work for the City Corporation in London, and we have a couple of sister sites where, where this species is recorded, Epping Forest and um, Burnham Beaches, and possibly Ashton Common as well. I'm not quite sure of that one. Um, but up in Suffolk, where I live, uh, which is about 60 miles north of London, um, I quite often go on the hunt out to uh, areas where I believe I would find uh, this particular species, although it's rarely recorded, the actual habitat is, is almost lost uh, to the landscape. Here you can see this um, triangle of old ancient woodland, which is ancient wood pasture. Uh, and it's actually been planted up as um, conifer plantation with these ancient oaks within it. Um, I suspected, although this is privately owned, it's managed by the Suffolk Wildlife Trust. And I was given access to go in because I suspected that this particular species would be in there on these oak volumes because <clears throat> It's the oak volumes that are quite rare here rather than the actual species of fungi. This is an annual species that only fruits uh, for a very short period of time during the summer, uh, in between the end of July and August. So it's often not recorded because it's, it's not always out there. Um, but it's these fallen old oak wood volumes, uh, hardwood oak volumes, that are quite rare, particularly in the urban environment, because these volumes would get cleared up um, by arborists, by foresters, by gardeners um, and it's that habitat that hosts this rare species that is that is in decline. Um, here's examples of abnormal uh, morphological features of species. So um, the left hand image here shows the anamorphic state of fistulina. Uh, has been called confistulina in the past but it's really just the anamorphic stage as opposed to the teleomorphic stage of fistulina hepatica, the beefsteak. It's like a brain mass uh, which has ascopores on the outside rather than putting a pore layer on the underside, which is what you'd normally find in the teleomorphic uh, state, the normal state that we'd find this. The central image shows the geotropism happening here where you can see the uh, realignment of the fruiting to gravity. So the original fruit body um, would have protruded from the oak or the, I think this is a beech, 
volume or possibly birch volume um, and then fallen over sorry let's go back one uh, would have fallen over and then when it fell over gravitation or uh, geotropism came in and it started to realign so you get these uh, different different um, aspects of different uh, levels of, of fruit bodies happening and then this right hand image which i've never seen ever since i took this uh, picture are uh, double-headed armored areas um, there's obviously a genetic a, a, a climatic reason for that happening possibly um, there's a lot of fungal books out there uh, for identification, and they will be a snapshot generally of a particular author's uh, understanding or records of m multitudes of different species. Here's a really good example of not always believing what you read, and this is not uh, condemning the actual authors, but it's maybe just the observation here. Um, this species, Pseudoenonotus dryadius, used to be Enonotus dryadius, the oak bracket, uh, in the majority of textbooks is, is described as being a basal decay species. And you would normally find it at the base, creating uh, what we call an Eiffel Tower effect, where you get the fluting happening in, in healthy sound trees, where the decay was almost in the, the taproot region of, of the actual base of the tree. But as arborists who, who are looking up quite often, um, but also climbing trees, we, we, we're noting that you, you find this particular species at height as well, which is not really recorded in the books. Um, and again, I, I suspect this is probably due to uh, the authors being scientists or, or, or people who are, who are not arborists and not climbing or, or looking up into trees. So uh, observations sometimes can give you a different aspect on what the books will tell you uh, that you should be seeing out there. Um, I suddenly see this uh, species fairly, fairly, fairly often at, at height, maybe up into the, the bowling. These arrows here at the bottom two images here show the height of where I'm seeing this particular fruit body uh, fruiting. This next slide is uh, a snapshot of Fomis formentarius, the hoof fungi. Um, Really interestingly, this image here shows the multiple tiering, the incremental growth of the, the, uh, the bracket. Um, and there's over 20 incremental growths here. Uh, and that's not 20 years of growth. It, this wood volume, the, the birch wood volume here, has probably fallen over within, judging by the actual lack of decay within that wood volume, I, I suspect that's probably only been over for about five or six years. Um, and the orientation of this bracket suggests that these incremental growths have happened in those six years since that tree fell over in the storm or what, or the root decay that took it over. Um, so I think this is a very good example of multiple layers uh, of pores and, and tubes that a, this particular species, Fomies, can put on in a year. So, but what very interesting about uh, Fomies was normally seen as being a, a Northern Europe, a Northern uh, UK species on birch. Um, but we've, we're, we're finding that like Podocypher that I mentioned earlier, we're starting to find this species on a very wide range and an increasingly wide range of tree, tree species, uh, particularly down in the southeast and, and at Hampstead. This uh, map here shows Hampstead Heath and the yellow circles are locations of where I've found um, and recorded uh, Fomis formentarius and, and the different tree species that we now see these on. Um, so not only are we finding it on birch, but we're finding it on beech, red oak, um, oak, all the English oaks, the rover, petraea. Uh, we're also finding it on red oak, the American oak, um, and also quite surprisingly on Cappadocian maple. Um, and when I've been over into Europe and visited places like Poland and Italy, I'm, I'm seeing it on even other, other species of trees that we haven't got here yet. So um, London Plain in Padua in Northern Italy, um, Lime, I've seen Fomis formentaris on lime in, in Poland, in a couple of the city parks there as well. So something's happening here. Uh, there's definitely a change in uh, host trees for this particular species, which was not long ago confined to one or two trees, but is now uh, moving southerly in the UK, but also increasing its tree species host. There are quite a few different strategies of fungal um, 
uh, colonization strategies. We have fungal induced dysfunction, um, like the armillaries, the honey fungus, which I mentioned earlier, which attack weakened trees uh, by the movement of its rhizomorphs, these black bootlace structures, which the hyphae and mycelium are within, uh, underneath the bark or going through the soil, as in this image here on the right hand side. Um, so that's one way of the fungi getting into the tree. Um, so they're seeking, excuse me, biologically or structurally weak uh, hosts. You then have the sapwood exposed, uh, the wounded trees, whether that be from pruning or from lightning. Uh, this left hand image here shows a lightning strike, which has opened up the sapwood um, and been colonized possibly or, or, or an open pathway for endophytic fungi to come out. But in this case, this is a, a sapwood exposed wounded tree, um, but also from storm damage where, where limbs are, are, are ripped off, uh, leaving open wounds. And then there's the sapwood intact, the endophytic fungi. I mean, there's a huge host of different species that are living already in the tree, waiting for the right, uh, the right um, occasion for, for it to fruit, um, whether that be the tree becoming dysfunctional or becoming wounded. Um, and then we see the fruit bodies develop um, from being already inside the tree. Um, very often when we're cutting wood volumes, we see almost quite rapidly uh, fruiting, fruiting occur. These, these six images are great uh, examples of where I'm, I've seen fruiting happen, you know, within almost days sometimes, or, you know, uh, this bottom, this top image here is the velvet shank, um, which has fruited on this volume, um, although it's gone very, very dark, it, it's within a few days of it being cut. And also we see quite a lot of biomechanical adaptation in trees, uh, which can be genetic. Uh, they can also be associated with decay happening within the tree, uh, within the heartwood of the tree and within the sapwood regions of the tree. And it's the tree putting on adaptation, extra strengthening wood in areas where it's needed to, to make its structure more sound. Um, I'm not suggesting here, I don't think that these are happening because specifically of, of fungi uh, interaction, but this is, is um, witnessing the tree putting on additional growth due to weakened structures. Um, but also trees fail without any uh, decay within them as well. So these are, these are very good examples of trees ripping apart in uh, unusual wind directions. Most of these are actually where where the winds are coming from, strong winds are coming from uh, non-prevalent uh, wind directions. Um, so quite often we'll get very strong northeasterly winds in the southeast of the UK, which are in, from a different direction than from where the tree is usually uh, growing against its prevailing wind, which is southerly winds. So wood decay, wind load, poor rooting environment, root growing environment can lead to tree failure. Um, these two images here tragically show two fantastic veteran trees that have failed for a very, very num a wide number of reasons. Um, the left hand image, this oak here, uh, split out um, in two very, very strong storm events um, with brown and white rot decay at, uh, in, the, in the oak volume up here. And the right hand image shows a root decay, uh, although the, the heartwood was brown rotted by fistula and hepatica, the roots here were colonized quite heavily by uh, Gymnopus fusipes, um, probably because the rooting environment uh, was very poor due to compaction. Um, but trees can live centuries with fungal colonization. So I don't know if this has actually been proved, but I suspect having seen these very, very ancient uh, trees living with almost uh, very, very thin uh, sapwood um, on the outside and with all of its wood volume inside decayed. Uh, I, I, I'd suspect these, these wood volumes or oh, trees can live for many, many decades or not centuries possibly with fungal colonies, colonizations. So I'm gonna talk a little bit now about decay and different decay types um, and the basic decay types, you have white rot and brown rot. And the white rot degrades the lignin and brown rot degrades cellulose. Uh, the white rot here on the left-hand side was in a horse chestnut 
wood volume um, and you have seriporous squamosis here degrading the, the chestnut and on the right hand side you have the brown rot or the later porous sulfurous um, affecting the uh, or degrading the cellulose. The other type of um, white uh, rot you have with the white rot, uh, the species associated would be Ganoderma and Armillaria, which degrades the cellulose and lignin, which is simultaneous at times. You have the selective delignification, which is degrading areas of lignin. And then you have the soft rots, uh, which is produced by species like Kretschmeria, Kretschmeria deusa, degrades the cellulose, uh, which but later may degrade lignin. And the brown rots, you have species like the later porous and fistulina. Here's an example of white rot showing how spongy. Uh, this is Meripolis giganteus within uh, the two right hand images here within the roots of a beach. Um, literally just showing my finger here going through the sponginess of the roots. Um, <clears throat> and the hardwood volume here, although these are diffuse porous uh, plane trees, this is in the notus hispidus, causing the white rot, the, the central part of that wood volume. Uh, the shaggy polypore showing um, the heart and cankered uh, decay on the outside of the stem here. This is a white rot species. Um, this is showing Fermis formentarius on birch, but what you can see here is the durable outer shell of the, the bark um, wrinkling up because the inside has completely been decayed uh, by the Fermis formentarius and probably some other species, but predominantly by Fermis. Um, and creating an intense white rot, spongy white rot, um, but the, the, the durable bark is, has persisted here and becoming wrinkled because the volume is shrinking inside. Um, another white rot decay, uh, we're looking here at the Meripolis giganteus, the giant polypore. Uh, this is on uh, the top left hand image is a standing beach which has had this colonization fruiting for probably 15 years or plus, I've been noting it on there. And although this tree is reduced, it's um, living in somewhat harmony with the, with the uh, uh, root decay fungi here. Although we do see um, beech trees fall uh, with complete root decay from predominantly from Meripolis giganteus. Um, more images of Meripolis fruiting and uprooted uh, trees that have had long term colonizations with Meripolis. Here we can see um, a tree which was still alive when it when it fell over in a large storm, um, but the intense brown rot inside or the, the um, extensive brown rot inside and the white mycelial sheets here, which um, I, I, I saw um, later for a sulfurous fruiting on this um, wood volume for a number of years. So I suspect the, the mycelial sheets here are probably from the later porous within the brown rot, the, the heart of this tree. Um, another brown rot species is Fistulina hepatica. Um, it doesn't seem to have those white mycelial sheets that the later porous has, um, but it's another brown rot species. Heartwood decay predominantly. These two images show a tilia uh, wood volume that's been colonized by Kretschmeria deusta. And um, these following images are Massaria disease of London Plain. Uh, it's a soft rot uh, decay. Uh, you can see the decay slowly uh, invading into the uh, dysfunctional wood volume here. These are generally on the top surface of the branches. Um, and this is, a, this is a, a concern for us because we, we're starting to see a large increase in Massaria, um, which I think in its natural state or just the way of the tree shutting itself down in periods of droughts, but with our soil volume issues in the urban environment, um, a lot of our tree species are struggling uh, with root growing conditions. And I think Massaria is probably on the increase because of the dysfunctional volumes happening because of that. Um, a species which is on the increase in London particularly is Formatoporia. Um, I've listed it here as punctata, but I think uh, it's possibly Mediterranea, which is a very similar um, species within the genus of Formatoporia. And it, it mostly affects London plane trees in London um, and seems to be uh, heavily associated with trees that, have, that are on a regular cyclical cutting uh, regime um, with lots of wounds. And again, in poor growing environments. Um, but once this species gets hold, it, uh, 
is quite voracious and creates a, a, an intense white rot um, within the wood volume, as these images show. Um, you're going to have to excuse me for rushing through here because I think I'm heading towards the end, but I want to get through these. But please take time to uh, enjoy enjoy or, or see these images again when this recording is, is put up on YouTube. Um, here we've got a, a local wood to me in, in Suffolk where I live. This is um, Bradfield Woods, which is a 800 year old coppice, continuous coppice woodland uh, with coppice stalls that are many decades, if not centuries old. Um, and uh, these are interesting to have a look at in terms of looking at different types of decay, different species of decay. When, when the coppice uh, are cut on cycle, um, it just shows, I think, that some of these wood volumes uh, don't need a lot of active sapwood to, to keep the crop of poles um, going on the coppice stalls. And decay can live uh, quite happily uh, with these coppice stalls for, for, for many, many years. Um, sometimes you get dual species that are quite evident within tree within tree volumes. Uh, here we have Ganoderma resonatum and Fomis formataris within the same basal area of a turkey oak. The uh, bottom image here shows Heteroposidium annosum and Kretschmeria deusta on the roots of a beech tree. Um, here we have the basal decay of Ganoderma resonatum on this uh, mature parkland beech tree, but in the upper regions, we have Fomis formentarius and also um, the golden, golden scaly cap, uh, Foliota orovella, within the upper um, storm damaged um, upper crown here. This is an example of showing two different types of decay within the same wood volume. So this is a birch wood volume with both white rot of Fomis formentarius and the brown rot of Pitoporus or uh, Formatopsis betulina. Um, so you can quite readily see the two different types of decay here um, the white spongy rot and the brown, quite dry ceramic brown rot there. More images of um, dual decay. Here we have uh, again Formatopsis, uh, sorry, uh, Fomis formentarius within the birch wood volume, but also with uh, the birch polypore as well. So again, you've got the white and brown rot within that same wood volume. Uh, this was an oak tree that sadly fell over in a, in a very, very uh, strong storm. Um, again, coming from a non prevalent direction, but uh, I think I mentioned this earlier, these this are roots issues with um, the spindle shank, uh, Gymnopus fusipes, although the tree had uh, heart rot decay inside, as you can see the brown rot here within, it was the root issue around uh, the base, which led to this leaning tree falling over. Uh, he has pseudoscrotial plates. You can see the dark melanin um, outside of different colonies within the wood, the wood volume, where different um, different species of sometimes, but also the same species can ward off areas of their wood volume um, from other areas from other species. Uh, this is also known as spalting, which can be highly prized by wood turners and uh, other wood users. Uh, more images here of the internal decay showing spalting, um, <clears throat> predominantly Kretschmeria deusta here, but also Udemensiella musida, the um, musidula musida, the uh, porcelain fungi. And then you often get green, well, you can get green staining um, in your wood volumes. This here from the green elf cup, or Saboria aeruginosis. Um, but they're two different types, which really can only be noted microscopically. And a set of slides here show um, us looking at using decay detection uh, equipment for ascertaining uh, structural stability of wood, but also um, how much decay is within the wood volume. So we here we're using a micro drill to show the um, the sound property or the actual decayed wood volume of Cretumaria within uh, Tilia. Uh, this this shows it very well here when in in this cut volume where the the, the needle is going through sound wood. This this um, high amplitude is showing this region of, of sounder wood, and then it drops off dramatically into the brown wood in the centre of the tree 
where later porous uh, in this wood volume has degraded uh, the, the, the heart of the tree. And then the needle's gone through that central zone into uh, what was active sap zone, um, where you can see the amplitude's gone back up again, where the resistance is, is, is higher. So this is a good example, I think. Um, we also use um, tomography uh, for, for ascertaining wood volume structure, uh, but also decay. Here is a tomogram of a beech wood volume um, where we brought a consultant in, uh, Paul Mellorange from Think Trees, um, showing how very little decay there was within this standing beech wood volume. And I just want to touch on the importance of fungi for habitat and, and species, other species that are associated. So insects, particularly uh, the fungivores, species that uh, feed off fungi, um, but also uh, utilize the brackets for their life cycle. So here on the left hand side, top image, you have Ganoderma aplanatum uh, and the galls of the flat footed fly, yellow, fat, yellow flat footed fly. Uh, where it's laying its um, its next generation within that oak in, within that Ganoderma, uh, and also the decay provides fantastic habitat for a huge array of of other species, um, bats and stag beetles and and even bees. Uh, a lot of our hollow trees uh, have have bee colonies, honey bee colonies, and and woodpeckers. Um, uh, the, the woodpecker will tap away uh, quite readily, listening out for the decay within the, the, the hollow of the tree. Um, and you can see that here in this cross wood section where we had to fell the tree. Um, you can see where the woodpecker has gone into the hardwood decay within the middle here. Um, we try and keep standing dead wood as much as possible. Uh, we now know the benefit of this in terms of what it can host. Um, in my time over three decades, in the early years, we used to clear up all our dead wood, whether it be standing or fallen, um, but we now have a, have a much better under, ecological understanding of the importance of the dead wood structures, keeping them standing as long as possible for their habitat benefits. Um, and it depends on the species. Uh, here, here are bad examples of, of long-term uh, habitat value. So these are willow um, salix species that don't last particularly well once they start degrading. Um, oak and beech and hornbeam particularly are very, very good standing deadwood volumes <clears throat> uh, with all the associated habitat benefit. Here we have an example of a very hollow tree at Hampstead, the hollow beech, probably one of the most famous trees we have at Hampstead, um, heavily storm damaged in the A7 gale. You can see here that the top of the tree was, was blown out completely, um, probably heavily pruned by the tree team back then, um, more than it probably needed to be. Um, but these reiterated poles that have happened since the H7 storm show the vascular health of the tree. Uh, it's putting on a new canopy, but unfortunately they're weakly attached. So periodically on a five year cycle, we go in and reduce the canopy height um, of this. So it's not a massive wind load because uh, it does stand out amongst its, its neighboring trees. Uh, another example of um, reduction work, sale reduction work of a tree with decay. So here we have a red oak with uh, long-term colonization of Ganoderma resonation. Um, you can see here the uh, structural sound wood in the outer sapwood regions, but the, the entire heart is, is decayed. Um, it's an isolated tree on a woodland edge, so a very, very large wind sail. Uh, so we've reduced and thinned out the canopy of this tree <clears throat> to lessen the, the, the wind load on that tree. Um, something I'd like to have spoken more about tonight, but I think this is probably for another presentation, is, is the condition of our soil and the poor condition of our soil and the threatened soil health from compaction, but also um, drought conditions <clears throat> and the increase in nitrogen and phosphorus in the soil and around the soil. Uh, this leads to very, very poor, tr poor tree root health. Um, we're in the process of starting up study programs, looking at uh, the compaction um, around our tree roots and the effect that has on the mycorrhizal fungi. Um, carried out some soil sampling, looking at the soil microchemistry and um, uh, looking at the bacteria, but also the fungi in the soil 
Um, <clears throat> I think this is probably a study program that we're going to need to set up um, before and afters for the next 10, 20, 50 years to see what's going on. And with the increase in our footfall, um, 10 years ago, we had anecdotally, we had 7 million people visiting our site. And within 10 years, that's gone to 10 million. Um, and as I mentioned right at the beginning of the talk, we, with the with the pandemic, we've had a, a much bigger increase in, in footfall. So we are having huge issues potentially with our, with our soil health. So decay uh, is a survival mechanism or via biomechanical adaptation, or is it fast track to failure? Um, I think it's probably a bit of both, um, but I think as I'm trying to allude to here, the soil health is critically important to the health of the tree and the mycorrhizal beneficial mutualism that's going on in that soil. Um, and this is something we really need to have a look at and understand. Um, quick shout out to a couple of books that are coming out by the Arboricultural Association uh, within the next six to eight weeks. Um, one is by the Professor Lynn Body from the Cardiff University called Fungi and Trees and Their Complex Relationships. Fantastic book. I've had a look at some of this already. Um, uh, this is a must get book and an accompanying book who myself and a colleague, Christopher Wright, have put together, which is um, also Fungi on Trees by the Arb Association. This is a photographic reference to help uh, arborists and ecologists with identification of up to 100 species of tree related fungi. Um, and just big shout out to Murphy the Fung Mutt, who is uh, my companion, my comrade in mycological adventure when I'm out walking in the woodlands of London and Suffolk. I think I'm going to end there because I've run over probably by a few minutes. Thank you very much, David. That was a really fascinating talk. Um, I like that. I like the Indian as well. I'm glad you had somebody kind of helping you out with their fungal identification. He's brilliant. He's really good. <laughs> uh, I thought that was just an amazing talk. You ranged over a really wide range of subjects. Uh, I like the mention of the, the fungi don't always read the books and the fact that we're seeing new things happening and shifting hosts. I think that's really interesting development, mm. that's, you know, kind of the reasons for that. We've had a very busy chat, so we will pick up, we'll probably just pick up a couple of questions but I know you said that, you, that people can get in touch with you afterwards as well yeah, so what we don't, yeah so what we don't get through um we'll, we'll make sure that we give people a contact for you so um David Howden are you okay to just um, pick up a couple of questions from the chat just before David talks if people want to turn on their cameras now as well they're more than welcome to so bear in mind that we are recording so you might turn up on the recording if you do um but yeah people are welcome to turn on their cameras if they like yeah, I'll, I'll pull out a few questions and ask people if they want to come in. If not, I'll read them out. Um, if there's a Lawrence Cox still there, you had a question about tree planting and fungi. Lawrence, do you want to come in or do you want me to ask it? Yes, um, I'll, I'll just stay on uh, voice only. Thanks for um, asking me to repeat the question. Yeah, I'm a complete novice at this, but I was just thinking that with so much tree planting going on in the UK and, and around the world, it's obviously a really good thing to do to help with the climate, but Given that um, the um, symbiotic nature of some fungi, would, would it be best to encourage this uh, colonisation within those tree planting, or is it best left for nature to take its course? That's a really good question, Lawrence. Um, thanks for that. Um, I, I, I think the answer is both, actually. Um, one, one, of the, one of the forests I, I, I look at quite closely uh, where I live up in Suffolk is on the on the border of Norfolk is Thetford, Thetford Forest, which is only only about 100 years old, really, um, planted after the First World War for the need for the timber after the war in yeah, <clears throat> 1919. Um, but that's that woodland, although it's, you know, 10 decades old or more, it is absolutely jam packed with mycorrhiza. And I suspect that, I mean, these were arable farmland prior to, to the, the plantation woodland going in. There were some pockets of um, <clears throat> indigenous uh, broadleaf trees in there, but uh, the variety of mycorrhizal species in there is absolutely astonishing. Uh, so I think what I'm saying is that fungi, uh, mycorrhizal fungi will come in its own time, um, <clears throat> but I think it wouldn't help to, to, to help that along. And I think soil condition, soil health is, is critically important. And also you can inoculate, you can inoculate soil health, uh, soil um, by bringing um, woodland soil into new planting site areas um, because you only need teeny tiny uh, bits of uh, uh, mycorrhizal fungi to, to colonize new areas. Um, as long as the soil volume is hydrated, 
not waterlogged, um, not uh, um, suffering with over nitrogen, nitrogen and uh, phosphorus <clears throat> and other other trace elements that really shouldn't be there, then then the soil health will hopefully do, do its own job uh, providing a, a good growing environment for newly planted and mature trees. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so David, maybe just time for probably really one more question. One more. Well, let me, because a couple of people asked about, about this. When you were talking about cutting samples out of the fungus, a couple of people asked, does that damage the fungus? Does that cause a problem? And should you no. stick, the, stick, the, stick the bit back in? That's a really good question. I'm glad someone brought that up. So I, I don't advocate damaging fruiting bodies. Um, I certainly don't advocate picking fruiting bodies, uh, uh, particularly the ones protected by law. Um, but uh, my own observations show that those wedges that I showed in the bracket fungi that I cut out, I, I tend to put them back in and the fruiting bodies will, if they're perennial, will, will grow over uh, those, those, those wedges. Uh, they fuse again. Um, I've got some images which I haven't showed today that, that, that uh, you know, 10 years after I've taken out the wedge, you can see, you know, 10 years growth of the, the perennial fruit body uh, that's uh, complete, that's um, closed up where I've taken a wedge out. Um, I, I'm sorry we can't take many more call, uh, questions today, but I am, I'm more than happy to take questions via email, um, which I'm sure we'll put up at some point. Are we all right to just um, pop your email? Do you mind doing that actually? Because I know we've got it, but um, if, would you, do you mind just popping your email into the chat, David? Would that be possible? And